going to move along anyway. All right, so home networking. Uh, we talked about this on this a little bit. We're going to go through this a little bit quick, but some must-haves for streaming. You have to have a reliable network connection. If you got here earlier, I was trying to play some Steely Dan, and Title would flash up a message, or Rune would flash up, flash up a message saying, hey, I can't maintain the stream. Title's not downloading fast enough. So I'm going to go ahead and try to skip to the next song. That's, that's kind of how it, what, how, how it uh, very gracefully recovered from that. It was not very good. So I, I moved cables and did some things to make our network a little bit faster. So we right. up. But by the way, one of the problems is if the network is compromised in here, the Wi-Fi network, yeah, yeah. because the router is in another room, and what we have is a network extender. And generally, network extenders are only about 40% to 50% as fast as the original router. So the bandwidth is not there. A lot of people will use, will, will use Wi-Fi. I'm looking in the room forums, and there are a lot of people that are complaining about similar issues. And they're like, well, I'm using Wi-Fi. Shouldn't that be fast enough? Wi-Fi can be fast enough. So to, to test, I have one DAC that does 32-bit um, 768 kilohertz, another DAC that does 32-bit 250, whatever the other one is. Anyway, 384 kilohertz, and um, they'll do DSD 512 and DSD 2. Anyway, it turns out that 32-bit 768 kilohertz is an obscene audio frequency sampling frequency that um, uses a huge amount of bandwidth, even more than DSD. So I stress test. I had this little Raspberry Pi 3B plus connected up over 5G Wi-Fi, and I ran two DACs. One of them uh, uh, upsampled to 32-bit 768 kilohertz, and the other one upsampled to 32-bit um, 384 kilohertz. And perfect. There was no drops. It was it was going pretty close to like maxing out what the Wi-Fi could do, but I was able to stream both of them without any problems. But I was pretty close. I had a pretty good, you know, clear path to uh, my Wi-Fi access point. But what, I, what I've looked though, I've got better tools for analyzing my Wi-Fi at home. And at any one time, depending on how much interference is happening in the neighborhood, about 40% of the uh, transfers will be retransmits. And so when you're doing Wi-Fi to these devices, um, that little device is going to be working harder because like every other packet that it's getting is messed up and it has to ask the other side to send it again. Um, especially if you're in a noisy Wi-Fi environment like me. So it's going to be working a little bit harder, which is means it's going to make a little bit more noise. And sometimes you're going to have some things that drop out. This is why I recommend to use a, an Ethernet cable connection instead. It's lower load on the, on the output devices because, I mean, unless you like messed up your network cable or you um, are running it underneath your uh, the transformer that feeds your house or whatever else, unless you've got something weird going on, the signal from the wired Ethernet cable is going to be much, much, much more reliable, much fewer transmits. I've run, I've run terabytes worth of data through my house on the wired Ethernet, and I've yet to see a retransmit or a network error on any of my outputs. But on Wi-Fi, it's 40% of the time sometimes. Yeah. Is that the root interface we're seeing today? Yep, yep, okay. it's the root interface we're seeing today. So must-haves, you've got to have a reliable internet connection if you want to stream. If we're streaming audio from the internet, you have to have internet. It's just if you want to have nice things, you have to have that. So uh, reliable home network, like I talked about before, you want Ethernet to at least two different rooms. Presumably, you're, um, you followed all my advice to the T, and so you put your noisy-ass computer someplace where it's not going to bother things, and now you've got your audio system in a different part of the house. Both of those should be wired, um, if you can, and then you use Wi-Fi for your tablets and the remote control types of things. Um, so that's kind of how that breaks out. The nice to have is a network attached storage. I talked to some of you when you came up here. I've got a little Raspberry Pi thing that's connected to a USB to a little two terabyte hard drive. But Synology, QNAP, a number of other, other manufacturers make nice kind of commercial quality or semi-commercial quality NAS devices that have got giant music collections. Most of us, to be honest, I think most of the people that I've talked to have less than two terabytes of local files. And you can buy a, a single hard drive that does that pretty well. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a NAS. You just need to have that storage someplace that's not in your listening room. And one, one quick note, like <coughs> hard drives fail, hardware breaks. Uh, probably if you have two terabytes worth of CDs, it probably took you three or four months to rip all those. And that's if you were really at it. You don't want to do that again. So, like, have more of them. I've got three of those. One of them I keep in my office so I can listen to my music at work over on Nirvana. I've got another one that my wife uses, and then I've got this one that I carry with me on the road. So, and I update them all every week or so. So, uh, I don't mind using that often. So, once a week works out pretty well. But you need to know your situation. How often do you need to back up your stuff? How do you verify the backups that they're really good and all that kind of stuff? There's an insane amount of information out there about how to do that properly. I'll just tell you that you really need to do it. And the way that you learn that you should do it is you have a loss that you can't recover from. And then you know from that point forward, some of you are nodding your heads, um, that you don't make that mistake anymore. Uh, so coming from someone who's made that mistake, don't do that. Uh, network, home network topologies. 
Um, in the olden days, you had like one computer that was connected to, straight to your little modem thing, and that's how you got to the internet, and that computer was the only thing in your house that could get to the network. We don't do that anymore for the most part. Um, there's an integrated broadband gateway. If you've got Comcast or at t you've got this little uh, box that may have some antennas on it or may not. It usually has a few Ethernet ports in the back that you can connect computers to. It also has built-in Wi-Fi, so for a lot of people, that's kind of your Wi-Fi connection as well as your wired connection. Um, it's a single device. It has some limitations because I have told you that you need to have a network connection in two different rooms in your house, and you can only have one of those in your house typically. So somehow you've got to get a network connection to that across your house. You can hire a low voltage guy to run a cable for you for less than 100 bucks or 200 bucks usually. So do that. Um, there's a star topology. This is kind of what I'm using here. So you've got a switch, a network switch, that you can connect a bunch of things to. Everything in your house home runs to one switch, maybe in your basement or your closet or whatever. It's a nice clean topology because everything is, is, is all connected down to one place. Um, you don't have anything with like multiple connections. It's easy to troubleshoot because either if the connection to that switch either works or it doesn't. Um, there's only one kind of network uh, cable running to all your devices. Um, so I recommend this one if you have a house that supports it. My previous house in Alpharetta, I had a 24-port 24 24 switch in the basement. It wasn't very expensive at the time, and then I kind of ran wired network cables to all the rest of the rooms in the house, through the attic and whatever else. And every, every room had at least two connections to the switch, and it was really, really nice. There's a, a distributed star. This is what happens when you when you live in a house like me that was pre-wired for Ethernet. So like five rooms have one network connection, but in your home theater you need like eight of them in order for it to work. Or in your you know in your audio room you might need two or three. And like different rooms need different numbers of connections. So you end up having to connect a switch to a switch. Um, what you don't want to do is connect a switch to a switch to a switch. You don't want to like let that path go too long. And so this is what I mean by a balanced star topology where. Um, there's no, uh, a single device in your network doesn't have to pass through more than a couple of switches to get to any other device on your network. And so you, you don't want to have switches connected to switches that connected to switches. Pay attention to your topology. Keep in mind as well, if you have a dedicated Wi-Fi access point, that counts as a, as a switch. So don't do a, a Wi-Fi access point to a switch to another switch. That's too many paths. It's, you're going to have some problems um, in a lot of cases. Or if you, even if you're lucky, you'll just have to do a lot of troubleshooting. So stick with the star topology if you can. Just have like if you, if you if your direct connection's not going to work for you or an integrated broadband gateway, just buy one switch. These switches are like 50 bucks or whatever that you can connect everything into and then connect that to your router and uh, you'll have a good life. Or or pay attention. If you've got questions about the balanced star topology thing, we can talk about it later. The main goal is pay attention to how you've laid out your network in your house so that it's robust. Um, where does the music come from? We talked about these lossless uh, streaming providers, most of them. Title is pretty popular. It's had a longer integration with Rune and, and some of the other companies than some of the other ones. Cobus is relatively new in the US, but it's not new overall. It's popular in Europe for a while. Difference between these two, Tidal, Hi-Fi streams CD quality stuff to, uh, into your house. Um, the highest resolution that it can do kind of natively is just 24-bit, 48 kilohertz, I think. Um, if you want more than that, then you use their masters, their QA encoded stuff, right? And then you do kind of subsequent encoding or decoding on your on your DAC. Kobus um, will let you stream 24 192 from the internet all the way into your house. It's a flat and a compressed stream, so it's about 50 uh, percent of what that file would look like normally. But if you've downloaded 24 192 files from HD tracks, you know they're pretty big. Like an album will be maybe a couple of gigs or whatever. Um, you're streaming that. This is the only streaming service that I know in the U.S. that lets you stream kind of that native high resolution stuff. Some people prefer MQA, some people prefer 24192, some people uh, don't care. Um, but those are kind of options. These are iFi had a, a kind of integration that was exclusive to Sonos for a while, and I think they've opened that up a little bit, but I don't know of any um, audiophile grade products that support them. So I'm not really kind of a big fan, but um, some people will use them and maybe down on some of the other devices will support them. Amazon Music HD, we talked about that a little bit. They're new. Um, a lot of people don't want to give any more money to Jeff Bezos for no. um, I don't trust him and things like that. My only problem with the service is that, is that it, they have not done any integration with any of our audiophile pals, really, that I can tell. There's a little bit of an integration, I think, with, with NAD's Blue OS, but nothing that I would consider sort of, you know, at our level. Um, and if you just play Amazon Music HD on your phone or on your laptop or computer, it's going to go through the OS mixer and the, the, the sampling the, the, potentially the bits are going to be kind of scrambled a little bit. They may be resampled. Other bad things happen. There's no way to guarantee a bit perfect path. 
from the streaming provider all the way down to your deck of Amazon Music HD today that I'm aware of. Until that problem is solved, I can't really kind of recommend the service. It'll be nice if it works because it's a bit cheaper than Tidal. Um, Coco's recently <coughs> reduced their price so that it's a little bit better price parity for all these things. All these things you're looking at somewhere in the order of uh, 15 to $25 per month at most. Um, that sounds like a lot. I know a lot of you guys have bought a lot more albums than that. Um, for me, it works out to be a bargain, but you kind of have to decide what your pricing and priorities are and what your comfort level is with these things. But it's pretty amazing to be able to access a library of, of, of you know, six million albums or so um, without having to buy one of them. To be able to, if John says, hey Dave, you heard this new thing from you know, the Duck Sacks remaster that, that is not very popular, that you should check it out. I can go look at it um, right away without having to go out to the store and buy it. For, but that social aspect that like we talked about before of us being able to share music with each other without like illegally sending each other files is tremendous. Uh, so don't write that off. They, these are lots of things, so if you're using any of these, you should stop. It's like if you're using to go jogging, if you're using them in your car, what's the noise for in your car? It's like friggin' 80, 75 dB, it's, like, it's really high. So, you're not going to notice lossy versus lossless. Treat it as background music. Yeah, this is background. This is background music. This is for your parents or whatever. There's some nice social aspects to Spotify that some of these other services haven't picked up yet. I get some of that aspect, but it's for audio files. We don't care about that. And then don't forget, you know, CD rips and needle drops and digital downloads. A lot of you guys have great vinyl collections, and you've done some experimentation. I know in this club with with getting really high quality digital recordings of your vinyl records that can sound like really, really convincing. Um, if you up your game a little bit with some of the streaming stuff, you can effectively stream vinyl playback in your house at um, a quality level that's virtually indistinguishable from the actual record playing, apart from the physical characteristic of looking at the record and uh, cleaning it and all the other things that you <laughs> vinyls have to do to, to survive in the world. Well, you've got, you've got a question here. Sure. Yeah. What about uh, internet radio? Ah, good question. So there are some pretty okay internet radio stations um, Lynn, for example, Lynn Records has uh, a couple of streaming channels. And I think there are some that are actually like lossless. Uh, Radio uh, Paradise is flag. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they're coming online a little bit more. A lot of them, I've, I've messed around with some jazz internet radio stations that are on the uh, 320 kilobit per second lossy, but I mean, they can still sound pretty good. It's, a, it's, a, it's another way to engage with the format. Don't, yeah. don't they all have, uh, every one of them that I've listened to have advertising on it? A lot of times they will. Uh, I mean, no, bandwidth is not free, so evidently just me. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 your mileage will vary, but uh, bandwidth isn't free, so they're they're doing something to kind of pay for that. Either they want to kind of they, they put the internet radio station out there, but then they want to steer you over to uh, some other product that they have, or there's a goodwill aspect to it. I listen to some radio stations in Amsterdam and France that are on the internet just because it's kind of cool to listen to a radio from another country. Um, and they have advertisements that I don't understand because I don't speak those languages. But it's, you know, it's, it's fun. To, it's a fun area to explore. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, what do you need to stream music to your stereo? You guys should be able to answer this to me now because I've talked about this so much, right? Yeah. Um, you got to have a component in your stereo system that can receive digital audio over your network and get analog stuff into your system. Like some of these devices we've got set on the table here. Um, afterwards, I can explain a little bit what some of those things are. But so there's one device that's Ethernet in, analog audio out. There's another device that is Ethernet in and USB out. That's like a network audio transport, and that's feeding a USB DAC. Uh, we've got John's DAC here that's connected over USB DAC to the same device. Um, if you've got a DAC that you like a lot that has a USB, a good USB implementation, you just need a device that will connect it to the network. Some DACs, like PS Audio and other people, have got these little daughter cards that you can insert. Um, and they say that you know that's connecting your DAC to the network. It is, but like you're shoving a little computer inside your DAC. I don't know if you want to do that or not. It sounds kind of gross to me. But I mean, <laughs> if you spend a lot of money and you know a lot of you know shielding and all the rest of it, so you can probably make that work pretty well. I'd, I'd rather keep them a little bit separated. Uh, you need a network computer someplace in your house, house to manage your library far away from the listening room, so it doesn't mess things up. Um, you'd like to have a beautiful but otherwise not not distracting remote control device. So one of the things I didn't talk about very much is. You know, we, we emotionally connect to music because, especially vinyl, because you've got like a nice piece of album art that you can look at, you can interact with, you can read the liner notes. The Rune guys at Rune tried to solve this problem by having a really nice user interface with uh, artist bios and album reviews and song lyrics and searchable metadata. If I want to see all the albums on Tidal that uh, Bernie Brenderman mastered, I can I can click on his name in one of the album credits and I can see like a thousand albums that are on there that he mastered. I'm pretty sure that 99% of those are going to sound really, really good. If you care about good sound and good mastering, 
you can search your library or a streaming services library based on the engineers who were involved in the reports. Or if you really like a certain basis, you can search on those. How do you do that with your vital function? Like you have to, Eddie can do that, but I don't know of anybody else who can. Maybe John can do that, but it's, oh, it's hard. Copas right? provides a little bit of that. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, um, Copas provides, the, the streaming service provides will provide a little bit of that, but Rune, Rune service is comprehensive in that sense. And so, uh, it makes it very powerful and very easy to then if you've got like an Apple iPad, I'm not a big fan, but they're really, really nice room and remote control devices. The colors are beautiful, the screen's beautiful, interacting with the device is beautiful, you can page through information, and you get kind of a little bit of what that that, that <coughs> physical handling physical media aspect of your music is. So you get some of that back. Digital tends to be a little bit sterile, separates you from the physical media, but if you've got a nice big tablet that you can kind of page through and interact with your music, um, then you can do that. What I try to do I tend to be a little bit uh, audiophile ADHD, so um, if I have a tablet in front of me, I'll start goofing around and not paying attention to the music. I queue up the music I'm going to listen to, I turn the, the, the screen from the tablet off and slide it across the room carefully if it's an Apple device, and because I don't want it to shatter or explode, and then I just sit there and listen to music, right? But you've got that opportunity to engage and interact. Talk, uh, yeah. Okay. You've got me semi-convinced that I want to try room. All right. Good. Okay. I mean, he's been working on me for ever since we started putting this together. He keeps telling me how great Rune is. And I understand that it has some benefits. Mm -hmm. My question is, if I go with the Rune uh, demo, mm -hmm. period, and I decide, you know, this is not worth this for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I back out of Rune, yeah. does it leave me where I am now? Because I'm I'm doing my I'm doing the control of my music mm -hmm. through Fubar 2000 yeah. or through uh, the uh, the uh, oh gosh J River or something else or no not J River Logitech or something. Uh, the uh, squeeze squeeze controller yeah the squeeze box squeeze box squeeze box server yeah. squeeze server yeah it's it's Logitech Media Server is mm -hmm. what it is. So I'm, I'm, I'm you managing my stuff through that. Mm -hmm. Does that stay intact or? Well, it stays intact if you leave it there, you'll feel sad that you don't have all this beautiful <laughs> stuff anymore. Um, and so there's that. Um, and you'll have to deal with your terrible choice of not continuing to use such a pretty thing. But besides that, <laughs> besides that, I think it'll be okay. We can still be friends. Um, what I'm saying is, <laughs> now if you if you go out and buy some rune specific hardware, like you go out and buy a $2,500 Nicholas Plus device, or you buy some rune specific outputs, and then you stop using rune, like now you're kind of stuck with things you can't use. So you gotta you gotta pay attention to how much you're gonna invest yeah. into this exploration. If you're not gonna buy any new hardware and you can use what you have then you can back out of So the basically, process. there's no impact for what I'm currently doing over DLNA. Yeah. Because Rune uses its own networking, yeah. using networking. Exactly, it uses its own protocols. But it'll use all the hardware that you have. I mean, not all hardware is compatible, but it'll use all the hardware that you have as well as it can. Okay. Uh, so that you can explore it without having to worry about. Uh, I mean, like a Squeezebox stuff. Touch, will it recognize Yeah, it supports the Squeezebox protocol, so it'll stream right to it. It won't use Rune's best protocol. Rune's got a protocol called Rune's Advanced Audio Transport that um, it's very smart, so it will analyze all the hardware capabilities of the DAC and then it'll set up properties in the server that match the properties on the DAC. It'll do format conversion if it has to. It'll let you take advantage of a hardware volume control if that device supports it. In fact, um, Rune certification program requires endpoints to support a hardware volume control, not a crappy digital one, but actually implemented in hardware. What's a Rune endpoint? So a Rune endpoint is the, the thing that you connect to the audio system. So all these things in kind of the front row. So it would thing. be the DAC? It may be a DAC with an integrated streamer, or it may be a network audio transport that's connected to the DAC. Uh -huh. um, but yeah. those things combined together are an endpoint. That's, it. that's, that's kind of the okay. output. That's the part that's safe to put in your listening room. But I think Rune is adding additional streaming protocols to your network, but it's not changing your data, your right. stored files. Exactly, exactly. Everything is in its own database related back to your stored music. Yeah, that's a good point. So a lot of things like like J River, if you if you ask J River to go scan your, your music collection and try to figure out like the replay game values for all the files, it'll write that information back to those files. It'll rewrite 
every file in your connect collection. Rune never touches your, connect, your, your data files. It stores a separate database off to the side where it stores that analysis. So you don't have to worry about Rune screwing up your files. It's not like Apple, I think Apple iTunes had a bug or whatever where it just converted all of your files to lossy and deleted the lossless ones and made everybody really mad. Rune doesn't do any of that kind of stuff. So do you have to decide between Rune and Jay River? They're one's a replacement for the other or? Yeah, so like I'll give you an example. In my office, I don't use Rune because Rune needs a network, and I don't control the network at my work, and the network security people would be mad at me if I tried to start bringing switches in and connecting things up, right? So I use Iron Bond at work. I've got it on my laptop. I've got a USB hard drive connected. I've got a USB DAC connected. Sounds great as a standalone system. Audio Barn, unlike Rune, is a very low CPU usage thing. It's got some OS optimization things, so it tries to quiet the computer down as much as possible. And then it's mostly, I mean, I do. I do, I might spend five or 10 minutes every once in a while to reset my brain and do some concentrated listening. Um, and it sounds good enough for that, um, but it doesn't have the flexibility or power for it at home. I don't use Iron at all. I use Rune because I control the network and I can have outputs all over the place. I think Tom over there has maybe eight or nine different outputs throughout his house. He can send music to any room in his house. He can move music from one music room to another. He starts out listening in the kitchen, really likes that tune and wants to go down to his big system listen. You can transfer that music to that other zone, and it'll happen, the transfer happens transparently. Um, so you have a lot of power. Root gives you a lot more power, and it's a much nicer thing to use. But you, it doesn't like if you have a specific use case where you use JRiver River in an office with a desktop PC connected to a DAC and headphones, you could still continue to do that if you want to, or you could switch over to using Root. And uh, I think you explained to me also that there's a difference between Root and uh, a streaming service. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Well, there's also a difference between Rune and some of these other players. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Because Rune, they give you the software, is that correct? Right, right. And you pay for the service. Correct, correct. And the other, in the case of J River and... No, you got it backwards. Yeah. I forgot if you buy the software, the service is free. You get a lifetime membership to Rune for like five years. That's not, that's not the way that I'm, I'm, that's, not, that's not the way that the Rune guys have explained it to me, but I'm, uh, perhaps I misunderstand. Anybody can have membership for five hundred dollars. Six hundred. Well, now it's six ninety nine, but it used to be four ninety nine. Yeah, the, 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 the lifetime membership was. Because they told me they're not making money, so they're going a subscription model where it's one hundred and twenty or whatever. It's one hundred nineteen a year. One hundred nineteen a year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have. Them. But the soft, I thought that this, the, the software, software is free. So anybody, all of you guys can go and download Rune Desktop, Rune Server, Rune Bridge. If you've got a Rune Bridge device, you can download the remote control software. Nobody's going to ask you for a credit card. You can download and install that software. It won't really work without the service, but the software is free. If you want it to work, then you have to subscribe to the service. But the service gets you kind of a lot of stuff, right? So all the all the album art that you'll see in a Rune UI is not the album art that you embedded in your files. It's a higher quality album art that they've licensed from the, the copyright owners. The, the song lyrics are licensed. You could go to the internet and scrape for song lyrics, and it's, it's kind of not so great as far as a, as a copyright perspective, but the song lyrics that Rune Service provides are all uh, copyrighted, and they're all licensed to Rune subscribers, and they're updated, so when new albums come out, you get more F-bombs in your sort of hip-hop music that you can read on the Rune UI, so I guess. Um, and uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, and the, the, the artist bio, so you can argue or not whether you agree with some of the reviewers that they have they are doing this or the service that they're getting from the room. But it's all, it's all paid for stuff that you're, you're getting kind of legally as a room subscriber and it's continually updated as the service is running. So it's not just, uh, you're not just like paying a subscription fee for a software license like you would do with Adobe Creative Cloud or some of these other things. Um, you're actually subscribing to a dynamic service that's continually updated and offers you know new value as uh, as your tenure of ownership runs. They used to do a lifetime membership thing. They're kind of killing that because it was it was great as kind of a startup to help them get going. Um, it's not a good business model for them. Uh, I think it's not really it's not really great as a, a subscriber either. It's sort of like if, if you want the software if, if you're if you're invested in the software and you really enjoy using it, you want it to continue them to continue to have a good business model so they can continue to support it. And if if you're not like contributing 10 bucks a month is what it works out to basically. If you're not willing to contribute 10 bucks a month to keep the service alive and keep it updating, then like at some point it'll go away. It'll go away anyway, like, nothing lasts forever, right? But I think that the model of a subscription service is a lot more sustainable for them. I just like, I don't have, I have one and a half fewer copy, co copies from Starbucks a month and my own subscription's paid for and I'm okay with that trade off. 
Um, you have to try to figure out for yourself whether that's good value or not. But if you think of Roan as, as a component in your audio system and not as, and not as a... Uh,